Hey, I'm glad to be here. I wrote in my notes. I was supposed to say I played baseball with him at Corbin and went to seminary, but he beat me to the punch. Uh, so I've known Chad for a while, thankful for him uh, that he'd asked me to come share. Actually, I don't know if anyone knows, this is my third time speaking at this church over the past like 10 years or something. I think it was the first, 10 years ago might have been the first time, but I haven't been here in a long time uh, uh, to share, um, but I'm thankful to be here. We had Chad... Um, just over a year ago, he came and did a whole retreat for our college students at Oregon State University. I'm pastor of Grant Avenue Baptist Church in Corvallis, Oregon. And uh, we, because it's Corvallis, go Beavs. I don't know if there's any, all right, go Beavs. Uh, we, we had a big win yesterday, by the way. So uh, we're, we're living large in Corvallis. But we have a lot of college students in our church, and we went on a retreat, and Chad was our speaker uh, just over a year ago. So thankful for him, and uh, I'm really thankful to be here with you guys and to talk about the church. Um, But specifically today, what I want us to think about is the church and justice. And I don't know what you think about when you hear the word justice, um, but your mind might go to social justice. That might kind of like ring a bell, kind of a a pop modern word that's used, or it might go to uh, like the justice system, judicial system. And uh, so what I want to do is really redeem for us what biblical justice is and, and what that might mean for the church. Uh, in order to do that, though, I, I want to tell you a story. And I want to tell you a story about a lady named Belma and the church, okay? Now, it's about our church and a lady in our church uh, in Corvallis. And there's a kind of a lot of people in this story. So you got to use your brains today keep up with me, okay? Because I'll say names, you're not going to know who they are. Uh, But just imagine they're nice, smiley people, okay? Uh, And we're going to walk through this story together. Belma was born in the Philippines and grew up in poverty. Uh, She, uh, her her mother would sell like meat at the local market. Her dad uh, was a carpenter by trade. Uh, So like whatever kind of money they could scrape together, uh, they would use to provide for their nine children. Uh, Belma, one of those nine, the second youngest in the family. Uh, Belma loved growing up. You know, when you grow up in poverty, uh, it's possible for you not even to know it, right? And in the culture in which she was living, uh, it's just reality, the kind of life that she was living in the Philippines. Uh, lived in a small two-bedroom house, a girl room, a boy room, and the parents actually slept in the living room. Uh, her family was actually really, really fortunate because they had enough land that they were able to grow uh, fruit trees and vegetables. They had chickens and pigs. They could go fishing, and they would buy rice with what little money they had, and that's how they survived. Um, She grew up Roman Catholic, attending the Roman Catholic Church, and Velma went through uh, elementary, middle school, high school, graduated from high school, went on to college in the Philippines, where uh, she studied to be a nurse, graduated with her nursing degree, and, and right after graduation, uh, didn't find a job as a nurse because uh, she needed to make money, and so found that the quickest job she could find, and uh, she actually um, kind of began to sell things and then became a caregiver and would help uh, people in her community. It was in 1992 that an agency, an international agency, approached her, uh, or she approached, um, about a job abroad that she would be able to leave the Philippines and travel. Uh, She went to Saudi Arabia for five years and actually worked on a military base there uh, in 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 like a hospital facility. She started as a messenger in the ward, uh, but was a hard worker and quickly moved up and became a medical assistant. She returned home, though, uh, for eight years. So five years in Saudi Arabia, came back home where she would be in the Philippines for eight years. She came home because her father had passed away and she needed to care for her mother. Eight years she was there, and in 2005, she got the chance again to go back to Saudi Arabia, which she took three years, 2005 to 2008. Uh, She would work in Saudi Arabia at the Royal Hospital. That's where members of the royal family were treated, and that's where she worked for those three years. Uh, Finally, in 2008, though, she decided she needed to get back her mom, to take care of her mom in the Philippines, and so she Uh, went back to the Philippines where she would take care of her mom. Um, And she would actually take care of other people in the community as well in order to make a little bit of money for her family. Uh, And in 2015, uh, at age 45, Belma had the opportunity to come to the United States. She actually had no desire at the time to leave the Philippines and come to the United States, 
but an opportunity was presented to her uh, that she was unable to pass up. And on September 2nd, 2015, Velma got off a plane in California and it initiated a set of events that years later, the US Department of Justice would declare to be human trafficking. Uh, human trafficking is modern day slavery. I don't know if you realize this, but at this point in human history, 2021, there are more slaves in this world than at the height of the African American slave trade. Human trafficking is the exploitation of the vulnerable for their bodies or for labor. Human trafficking is the exploitation of vulnerable people for their bodies or for labor. For their bodies, like sex trafficking, you may have heard of. In fact, Portland ranks like what top five uh, of cities in America for sex trafficked victims. Um, uh, sex trafficking is the buying and selling of predominantly women and girls for the purpose of sex, and it generates nearly $100 billion a year. Human trafficking is the third most lucrative activ illegal activity in the world behind weapons deals and narcotics. In the United States, the Department of State in 2019 reported the most likely source of girls to be bought and sold for sex was the foster care system in the United States. Girls without a stable home and consistent force of love. Uh, they are particularly vulnerable. And what I want you to see today as we work through this story is that our God has a heart for the vulnerable. And not only that, he has called the church to do justice on behalf of those who are vulnerable. Globally, over a million children are bought and sold for sexual exploitation. And that doesn't count a child who is already owned and not sold that year. Although sex trafficking generates the most money, uh, it actually only makes up about 20% of all human trafficking, of all slavery cases in the world. Uh, the, um, the, what's actually the greatest source of human trafficking is trafficking someone for labor. The United Nations says that 24.9 million people are victims of forced labor uh, in the world today. There are, uh, forced labor might include farming, fishing, uh, constructions, whole families will be bought and sold and forced into labor in different parts of this world. Uh, the United Nations says there are 10 million children in a forced labor situation today. Just think about that. 10 million children forced to work oftentimes 16 to 20 hours a day for little or most likely no pay against their will. About half of all forced labor is what is called domestic servitude. And that is the story of Belma. An individual will often live with a family, do household chores, clean, cook, watch children for a family, and that family will control their every move. You know, the abuse of the vulnerable for the sake of the powerful is nothing new, right? Think of the nation of Israel, enslaved 400 years to serve the Egyptians. If you have a Bible, what I'd like you to do is take out your Bible and go to the book of Micah, Micah chapter 6. And I just want to share uh, a verse with you in Micah chapter 6. L let me, uh, the, the key verse is going to be verse 8. Let me read to you verse 6 and 7 first, though, okay? Here's what it says. With what shall I come before the Lord? This is a question that's being asked. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Like, really, like how, what, what should I do in response to my God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with a calf a year old? That's the question. What does God want? Does he want an offering? Verse 7, will the Lord be pleased with 10,000 rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Now it's like hyperbole. You can't really bring 10,000 rivers of oil, right, to sacrifice to God. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now, now here's verse 8, and this is the verse I want us to see. He has told you, O oh man, this is, this is what Micah responds, he has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what God requires, is that we would do justice, or some versions say love mercy, that we would walk humbly with our God. And so what I want to do with my time is I just want to settle into that first command, that we would be a people who do justice. Now, the Hebrew word for justice is the Hebrew word mishpat. So can we say that together? 
mishpat. There you go. See, we learned some Hebrew today. Uh, mishpat. It shows up over 200 times in the Old Testament. Justice is central to the theme of the Bible and close to the heart of God. And it ought to be close to your heart as well. Mishpats. It literally means this, to set things right. Mishpat. Setting things right. To do justice is to set things right. Now think of mishpat as like a two-sided coin, okay? On one side of it, we have what you would call retribution, retributive justice. And this is what you think of when you think of justice most likely. You're speeding down the road and you get a ticket and justice says you have to pay a fine, right? Or maybe not just the judicial system. It could be like if I borrowed your shovel and I broke it, what does justice say? I should buy a new one and replace it. And the people of God ought to be about justice, retributive, retribution. We ought to set things right. That's typically in our American minds what we think of when we think of justice. And this is good. This is true. This is why Jesus had to die on the cross, right? Because our God is a God of justice. And a penalty had to be paid for sin. And Jesus pays it on the cross. He satisfies the justice of God. Everything is set right. But there's another side of the coin. The other side of the coin is restorative justice. Restorative. And actually, the majority of the time in the Old Testament, when we see the word mishpat, it's referring to restorative justice. Uh, it's, it's giving someone what they are due, setting things right. For example, just this morning in the church that I pastor, I was talking with a single mom after church, and we were talking about life and stuff, and she's, she's working like a full-time job, got her kids in school, uh, but it's struggling to pay bills, right? And so what does justice say? Set things right. Hey, the church would love to cover your electric bill this month. Because that's justice, is it not? We're going to set things right for her. You shouldn't be in a situation where you're scared about your electricity bill going off as a single mother, right? And we got to be wise about that, but we want to be a church of justice and set things right specifically for the vulnerable. You know, justice reflects the character of God. Psalms chapter 146, verse 7 through 9 says this. Uh, it says, who executes, or God executes mishpat, justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. And then notice what the Lord does. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners or the immigrants. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. You see all the ways in which he cares for those who are vulnerable in our world? Because he wants to set things right. Justice is specifically directed toward those who are vulnerable. Jeremiah 22, 3 says this, Thus says the Lord, do mishpat, do justice and righteousness, and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed, and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. Uh, that, that God cares about those who are vulnerable in our world. It's listed there, the resident alien, the, the fatherless, the widow. Uh, that's who God wants the church to care about and set things right. Um, so what I want you to see with the rest of Belma's, Belma's story is that setting things right is something that God does, but he can use the church to accomplish that. God wants to set things right, and he will use the church to accomplish that. And so the story that I'm going to tell uh, is a story of injustice. And injustice is ugly, and it is difficult to hear at times. But I hope that what you'll see is that when justice, when things are set right, it is beautiful. And the results will lead to a whole lot of worship and rejoicing. I want you to notice in the story as well that justice does not require a superhero. It does not. It just requires believers who step into the will of God and say yes and care about those who are vulnerable. So you're wondering why Belma came to the United States. She came to the United States um, because a friend of hers, uh, a mother, a friend of hers' mother, was uh, in need of medical help. Um, the friend's mother had a knee problem. It actually gotten so bad that uh, she would need to come to America to have surgery in the Philippines. There was no way for this surgery to take place. Uh, and she would need to come, and there would be this long recovery period here in America. 
and she would need someone to care for her. Remember, Belma has caretaking uh, medical um, they traveled even around the world. Well, this friend of hers, um, mother, has a number of children, and all of those children actually tried to get visas to come to the United States, and all of them were denied, unable to get here. And they thought, well, Belma, she's left the country before. Uh, certainly, she'll be able to get into America. And so they asked her, kind of went back and forth, and Belma uh, knew that, man, if she didn't go do this, this woman might even die without getting the treatment she needs. And so Belma reluctantly agreed to leave the Philippines and come to America. She arrived, uh, and for the course of three months, she took care of this lady. After the surgery, the lady got better and is ready to return home to the Philippines. And Belma had planned at that time to go back to the Philippines as well. When a Filipino lady, another Filipino lady uh, named Anna, who lives in Corvallis, that's where I'm from, Corvallis, Oregon, uh, who was actually related to this family that Belma was helping, approached Belma and offered her two times as much pay to come to Corvallis and be a caretaker for her two-year-old boy. Uh, Anna is married to a man named Scott. When I met Scott for the first time, uh, I remember standing in the doorway, and Scott is kind of this towering man, uh, big, uh, tall, um, but at the same time has a number of medical issues, and uh, Anna would work during the day, and Scott would stay home because he was unable to work but it was also difficult for him to take care of this little boy, and so they could use help. Uh, when she first heard of this opportunity, it seemed like a very good deal, not only for her, um, but also the opportunity to take care of and help this little boy, and, um, and she could make some money. And the deal looked like this. Live with us, and you get a room to live in. We will pay you two times what you are getting paid now, which, by the way, would equal a whopping $200 a month. Anna promised to take care of the U.S. authorities and get her visa renewed. She's only here for three months, right? I mean, it was a short-term visa to the United States, so Anna says, you can have a room, we'll pay you two times as much, uh, and we'll take care of your documents so that you'll be legal here in the United States. And so they made the journey up to Oregon, um, to Corvallis, into the neighborhood that's actually not too far from our church. As soon as they got there, Anna said, give me your passport. We'll keep it safe for you. The United Nations report on human trafficking says the first three steps in trafficking a human is this. Number one, the promise of false economic gain. Number two, the withholding of identification papers. You know, being trapped isn't just about being behind bars. Slavery doesn't have to involve chains. The third step in trafficking, treating someone with violence. The first day she arrived in Corvallis, Anna told this to Belma. In the United States, it is important not to gain weight, but to lose weight. Isn't that a funny thing to say to someone? It is kind of important in the United States for some reason. You must lose weight, Belma. And Anna handed her two dozen eggs and said, this is your food for the next week. Roughly what would be three eggs a day. Belma would cook meals for the family lots of food for the family, but she was not allowed to eat. She could only eat her three eggs a day. The kitchen was, kitchen was arranged in such a way that all the food was kept high on the shelves in the cabinets. When Belma was to cook, she would actually ask uh, that Scott or Anna would get up and get the food out for her. Um, Anna would keep tabs on all the food. If any food were to go missing, she would know about it. This is forced labor and injustice of the vulnerable. After one week of living off three eggs a day, it was declared that two, uh, two dozen eggs was too much, and now she would be given one egg a day. She quickly lost 30 pounds. In the morning, each morning, the family would get together and eat bread and drink coffee for breakfast. You know, the forced labor of a person requires psychological manipulation and abuse. And Anna would say to Belma, you should eat breakfast so you can be strong and you can work. Eat some breakfast. And Belma would respond, but Anna, the bread and coffee, they're so high up, I can't, I can't reach them. And then Anna would pretend to ignore, like, would ignore her, pretending not to hear her at all. Well, one egg wasn't going to cut it, so eventually the family did add a package of Pop Ramen to her daily rations. All the while, she has to work 18 to 20 hour 
work days. She would clean, cook, do household, household chores. She'd take care of this little two-year-old boy, a little boy that she would grow to love, a flicker of light in a very, very dark world. But they controlled everything. They told her when to wake up and when to go to sleep. They controlled the amount of food that she would eat and her communication with the outside world. Now remember this, she's new to the United States, does not speak English well, uh, she has no friends, she cannot drive, she's not allowed to make friends. Uh, man, evil is ugly, injustice is painful, and Belmer grows weaker and weaker. Her diet wasn't really enough to sustain life. In fact, uh, Belma told me a story of happening on uh, many occasions that she would make chicken and rice, rice on the bottom of this casserole dish with chicken on it, some other stuff, and the family would be eating it. Uh, and uh, Anna um, would eat the meat of the bone of the chicken and then place the bone on the, the casserole tray there with the rice kind of crispy on the bottom there um, and the bone sitting there. And then she would say, Anna would say to Belma after the family had eaten, Belma, you look weak and pale, you must eat. Look, we left food for you. Eat it. Belma's words to me. They made me as an animal. I was a dog. I refused to eat it the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth, the fifth, but eventually I'm hungry. So I ate what was there. When Israel had been enslaved for 400 years, women raped, babies killed, forced to work endless hours and build up a great nation of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 24, um, it says this about God hearing the cries of the vulnerable who were oppressed. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God and all the while, while Belma, living just blocks from our church, enslaved, cries out to God, and God knows, and God heard. Belma's not in a good place, though. You can imagine she's weak, she's tired, she's discouraged. This has been going on for a while. On one particular night, about two in the morning, when she finally finished what she was to be doing that day, Belma made her way to her bedroom. She was feeling particularly bad on that occasion. She was hungry, she was sick, she was tired, she was unable to fall asleep. And so there she was, reading her Bible in the middle of the night. It is then that she prayed out in desperation to God, cried out in desperation to God. And I imagine that desperate prayer, one that I cannot understand, one that you probably can't understand either, a prayer like the Israelites. In Exodus chapter 2, God, do you see? God, do you hear? God, will you respond? Here is what Belma told me she prayed. God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Take me out of this house. No one else can help. God, it has to be you. Take me out of this house. Prayer of desperation. Now, that little boy, remember, that she was taking care of, had spent time in Belma's bedroom earlier that day. And he had left behind his iPad in the room before he had gone to his bedroom to go to sleep for the night. And it was that night, after that prayer, in the darkness of the night, the iPad lit up. You know how it is when your device turns on at night in the dark and it lights up the room, a glow over the room, and Belma moved over and she picked up that iPad and she looked at the iPad and it read Grant Avenue Baptist Church and below it, the phone number of the church. And there is no conceivable reason why a notification would show up on iPad in the middle of the night with the name of a church and a phone number. Well, not at 2 a.m., but later, using the family phone, Belma would call that phone number. 
And actually, one of our other pastors at the church, Pastor Don, picked up. Belma said, I need to come to your church, but I have no car. Can you pick me up? And Pastor Don said, well, we don't really have a specific ministry for going and picking people up, but let me make some phone calls and see if I can find a lady in church who will. Now enter another character you have to remember in this story. Her name is Catherine, Catherine Erickson. She volunteered to pick up Belma. You know, God does care about the oppressed. He does. And he wants to set things right, and he will use the people of God and the church to do it if we are willing. And our supernatural God, <laughs> not only did he use an iPad, but he will use Catherine as well. Now, getting out of a house where you aren't allowed to leave unsupervised is not an easy feat. Velma had come to realize, though, that Scott, this husband, was more sympathetic to her situation. Velma knew that Anna would never let her go. Never but maybe Scott would. So Belma approached Scott one day when Anna was out. Sundays are my day off. I don't have to clean on Sundays. You don't make me work on Sundays. I need to go to church and pray. It's important. Can I go to church? And he said to her, it's your day off. You should be able to go to church and let her go. And so Catherine picked her up and brought her to church that Sunday. Kind of like here, uh, we have two services at our church on Sunday mornings, and in between the two services, uh, there is, there's food and coffee and drinks sitting in the lobby. Velma showed up and filled up her plate with snacks that Sunday. She ate and ate and went back for more and got more food. She told me she was embarrassed that she was eating so much as she would show up to church. No one knew what was going on. She sat through church that day, and uh, Catherine did at the end of that day, I think what um, people rarely do, but we probably should do more of in church. Catherine invited Velma to go out to coffee after the service before she would take her home, just to get to know each other. Velma refused. She knew that she needed to get home quickly. She wasn't allowed to go off, out to coffee with someone, right? She had to get home. So Catherine dropped her off and left. Now, I want you to notice two things, okay, about the story the rest of the way. I want you to notice, first of all, the generous justice of the church. And when I say church, I don't mean like Grand Avenue Baptist Church, like an organization. I mean the people of God. I want you to notice how the people of God work to set things right, work towards retribution and restoration of the vulnerable. But I also want you to notice how the church can work together for justice. Justice requires that you see, and Catherine saw Belma and responded with a generosity that we rarely see today, and it will result in justice. Belma had actually told Catherine that her birthday was later that week. She comes to church, later that week is her birthday. Now, I gotta tell you, even as a pastor of a church, if it was your first Sunday at church, and I met you, and you told me it was your birthday later that week, I would probably say something like, happy birthday on Thursday, right? And then maybe, if by the grace of God, I remember the following Sunday and you showed up back to church, I might say, hey, how was your birthday? Right? That seems like a nice thing to do. Catherine, on Belma's birthday, after just meeting her, drove over to her house and knocked on the door. Anna answered, hi, I'm Catherine. Is Belma home? It's her birthday. I want to take her out. I would ask Catherine about this uh, day that she showed up. Catherine, why would you drive over to this lady's house that you just met, knock on the door, take her out for her birthday. And Catherine said, well, I, I knew that she seemed like she was alone. Her family was all in another country, and it was her birthday, and she deserved to go out for her birthday. I'll tell you what, that's setting things right, is it not? That is justice right there. Well, in the moment, as Anna is standing in the doorway with Catherine on the other side of the door jam. Anna couldn't say no in that moment. How would she be able to explain that? And so she let her go out to coffee. When they came home, Anna was very, very angry. Catherine told me Anna didn't like me very much. Velma wasn't allowed to go back to church for the next month. From the beginning, Anna was cruel to Velma. Velma had many bruises because of an elbow thrown here or being pushed over there. You know, to gain control over someone, there's a, there's a lot that has to take place behind closed doors. Edmund Burke once said this, all that's required for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. 
All that's required for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Belma was eventually allowed to go back to church and got permission to be gone all day, actually, with Catherine on a Sunday. And so Catherine and her husband, Jim, would invite, her, invite Belma over to their house after church. They'd get up, they'd go eat the snacks at church, go to service, they'd go home to their house, they'd have lunch together, and then Belma, almost every single Sunday, would crawl into bed and fall asleep, and sleep all afternoon because she was exhausted. And then finally in the evening, they would pack up the leftover food. Belma wasn't allowed to own a backpack, and so they'd put it in a brown bag, and she'd take a little bit of food with her back to the house in the evening. It was one of those Sundays that Catherine confronted Belma. Things just didn't seem right. Catherine told me that things just didn't make sense. Why couldn't she go anywhere? Why didn't the family teach her to use the bus system in Corvallis? Why did she have to work so many hours? None of it really made sense. Catherine asked Belma to tell her what was going on. And Belma told Catherine, the first person who would know of her situation. You know, words like slavery and human trafficking were not used, but the story was told. Catherine saw and she felt what was going on, and she would certainly respond. But not just her. Belma actually received permission to attend a Tuesday night women's Bible study at our church, and different ladies in our church on a routine basis would swing by and pick her up and bring her to church for that hour and a half, two hours, and take her back home. You never know, do you, what's going on in someone's life and what a picking someone up to bring them in might do. Justice is not just an individual responsibility. It's a corporate one. This all came to a head one particular Sunday morning. Belma's very weak. She hasn't eaten a lot, and she's barely slept, and she arrives to church, and she feels like she's going to faint. Not the first time she would have fainted. She finds a chair out in our lobby. She leaves the sanctuary, goes out into the lobby, sits down. An usher actually brings her a cup of water that she drinks. She obviously isn't feeling well, and there's another uh, husband and wife in our church uh, and they see that she seems to be struggling. They say, hey, you don't look well. Let us take you home. And so they put her in, in their car, and they take her home early from church that day. And when she gets home, Anna is surprised to see her getting home so early. The, the husband had walked Belma up to the door to make sure she could get there and, and got her into the house. And what happened next wasn't the first time this had happened, but it would be one of the last. Now remember, right, Belma had been bringing leftover food home and people have been very willing now for a while to pick her up and give her rides on a Sunday or Tuesday and now this couple had driven her home in the middle of church to drop her off at the door. And Anna in that moment as the door is shut and that husband walks back to his wife and they drive away, Anna looks at Belma and accuses her of exchanging sexual favors for the food and goodness that has been shown her. In Anna's mind, Belma's not worthy of that kind of generosity. And Anna tries to strip off the clothes of Belma to see if sex has taken place. Oppression knows no boundaries. After this Sunday, Catherine declares, enough is enough. Belma, you need to get out of this house. But Belma's scared. She's scared of Anna. She's scared of what would happen next. Now, I want to make a really, really important observation here, one in which you, you, you don't know. Katherine Erickson is a middle-aged, unimposing woman. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being powerful and strong, Katherine's a 1.5. Like, she has faced her own battle of debilitating sickness. This is not the person, if a movie was made, you would think would spring her loose from captivity. But don't tell Katherine that. Because justice doesn't require anything of you but a willingness to actually love your neighbor, to see a need, to feel it, and then respond. And so they plan the escape. The plan is simple. Get your passport and get out of the house. Belma knows that Anna won't let her go, but maybe Scott will. So she waits for a good time. She approaches both of them, Scott and Anna, and tells them that she would like her passport and will be leaving now. Scott immediately is, immediately is agreeable, but Anna protests. You can't leave. We're responsible for you. We are the ones that take care of you. 
Now, Catherine had anticipated this actually and told Belma, not to my knowledge, but had told Belma that the church had offered her a job and she'd be working there. Therefore, she would not be be taken care of anymore. There was no job offer, but that's what they had devised to escape. Anna reluctantly agreed, and Belma left peacefully. There was no escape in the darkness of night. She walked right out the front door with her passport. Her visa expired months ago. It had never been renewed, but she was free from the house. She stayed at the Erickson's house for a while, but, but justice requires more, does it not? So we don't stop there. They secured a lawyer, a lawyer whose official title was Advocate for, of Human Trafficking from the Department of Justice in Portland. Belma would then move into the house of another couple. Here's the last names you need to know. Cecil and Vi Stark. Uh, they are an elderly couple in our church. And they said, we have an extra room. Belma, you come live with us. Sometimes doing justice takes an entire church. She was interviewed in Portland by experts in human trafficking, and Belma was told that this, this was definitely human trafficking, and they would act on her behalf. Justice isn't just about retribution, though. It's about restoration as well. When Belma moved into the Starks' house, she was given her own room with a queen-sized bed, and she was given privacy, something that was foreign to Belma. Vi, the lady, told Belma, if you're hungry, go to the refrigerator, open it up, and eat whatever you want. If we run out of food, we'll go to the store and buy more. Shocking news to Belma. But when I asked Belma about her time at the Starks house, which ended up being over two years. She said having food was the smallest part. She said this, they really comforted me when I needed comfort. See, that's setting things right. It was in that house that, house that Belma regained her strength, physical strength, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Belma said that there were many times she'd just sit in the house and cry, and Vi would walk over and sit next to her. Belma commented, She has a very big family to care for and her own medical issues, but she took the time to sit with me. This is a generous justice. Justice doesn't require superheroes. It just requires a willing heart. But it wasn't just helping, it wasn't just sitting with her that helped Belma. On one occasion, the Starks, this elderly couple with Belma, had gone shopping at Home Depot in Corvallis when they saw Scott, the husband and that little boy, the two-year-old, walking through Home Depot. Belma began to shake. She left Cecil and Vi in the store and returned to the car to wait for them to finish shopping. In the car, she noticed across the parking lot another car, and there was Anna sitting in the car across the parking lot. And immediately, Belma remembered a time that she had been asked to clean that car that Anna was sitting in and had found a small gun hidden in that very car. Fear overwhelmed Elma, and she slouched down in her car. The Starks returned to find her shaking, scared in the car. Vi looked her right in the eyes, this old lady, and did what she doesn't do very often. She yelled, you are strong. You have a phone. If you're in danger, call 911. Belma was strong. And Vi taught her to be strong, but it was also okay to cry. But we pray, because prayer is what makes us strong. And so for over two years, she lived with them, a generous justice. The Department of Justice brought Anna in for questioning. She denied it all. It's a really complicated story. Maybe I could tell the rest of it someday. But in the end, the Department of Justice declared, Belma, you are a victim of human trafficking, but we cannot prove it or prosecute you know it's, I think it's something like only 10% of human trafficking cases that are, that are brought before the courts ever even uh, people are found guilty. And her case never even got brought anyway. It's hard to prove. There was another lady in our church who secured Belma a job as a caretaker. She began to make money. And it was actually at that job that she would meet, because of that, not at that job, but because of that job, that she would meet a man named Steve who would become her husband a man who loves Jesus and who, love, and who would love Belma. Today in Corvallis, Belma lives free and walks in the restoration that comes because of Jesus and the church.
practice justice on her behalf. And her story's not over. It's still going. But justice is about acting wisely and responding to the vulnerable in our community. It's responding to the single mom who needs help. It's responding to the homeless who needs help. Justice, things set right. The widow who needs things set right. The abuse victim or the foster child. You name the vulnerable. And the church should be on the front lines of demonstrating doing justice, as Micah said. In the book of Amos, chapter 5, um, it says this in verse 21, and this is from uh, the message, it's a paraphrase. I can't stand your religious meetings, it's a prophet speaking. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I am sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. And I think about the church. For all the things that we can be about, oh church, let's be about justice. At the heart of God is being vulnerable people. That we would be a church that sets things right. To end my time, though, I would like to introduce you to Belma and her husband, Steve. Would you guys come up here? Can you guys give them a hand? You take that. You're good. This is Belma and Steve, uh, who uh, love Jesus and love each other. And I asked Belma if she would just share one thing with you, okay? Because um, she, does, she doesn't really like talking in front of people. We're good. Uh, um, I'm so thankful for her for letting me share her story with you, right? Uh, it takes incredible courage to allow your story to be told and, and vulnerability. Uh, but the question I get asked the most um, in our church by people and that, like, about this whole situation, they ask, uh, Belma, have you forgiven Anna and Scott? So that's the question that a lot of people ask. Like, have you forgiven them? So you tell us. Have you forgiven them? Yes, no, why? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because God is so generous to me, so I have to be generous to her, even though it's hard. Isn't that incredible? God was so gen. Okay, you can help me. <laughs> God was so generous to me, so I have to be generous to them. You know, you know why she can say that, guys? It's because the church was generous to her, too. You know how God shows his generosity? It's often through others. And so let's be a church, right? Let's be a church who sets things right for the vulnerable. You never know. You know, the majority of people who helped her in that story did not know of her story. Like, if you knew, if you knew now, well, obviously everyone would be the first person to pick her up, right? But there's no idea. And they said, oh, a lady needs a ride? We'll pick them up, right? We need to get lunch, get food, come stay at our house, take a nap. I mean, can you imagine inviting someone over to your house for lunch and then she sleeps for four hours? <laughs> right? It's a generous justice, setting things right. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray. Can we just pray as a church over these two? Because the journey's not over, right? Uh, can we pray for them? But then pray for us as a church, you guys as a church too, when it comes to being a church who lives out and does justice. Let's pray. God, thank you for, um, for Steve, a husband that loves Belma well. But God, thank you for Belma and the freedom that she has found. Not only the freedom spiritually that she found in you, that you secured on the cross, but God, the physical freedom that you delivered to her. And God, I'm so thankful for um, believers who stepped up for Catherine, uh, who showed up to pick her up, who saw signs that things aren't right, for the Starks who brought her in, um, and for all the other people in church who took time to speak with her, to get to know her. God, I pray, though, that um, in, the, in the weeks and months and years ahead, God, I know that you have a great plan for their lives. I pray that they would follow in step with your directing. And God, you would bring and continue, you would, you would continue to bring healing and restoration to, to them. And God, I pray for this church, that this would be a church that's about justice, setting things right for the vulnerable. God, it's at the heart of you, and it can be at the heart of us too. Thank you, God, for saving us. Out of that, may we do justice well. We pray all these things in your name.